You're listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Canada's health care should be much better. We have brains. Our doctoral graduates are among the most productive and respected researchers in the areas of health services, health policy, and health economics. We have funds. Figures from the Commonwealth Fund show that Canada spends roughly 10.4% of its GDP on health, which is more than the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and Australia. Yet those same Commonwealth figures rank Canada poorly on health care performance, even behind those countries spending less than us. How are we doing so badly? Why aren't brains and funds enough? Stephen Bornstein at Memorial University spends a lot of time thinking about health care management. He explains our poor Commonwealth standing this way. We have one of the most expensive health care systems in the, world, in the world. The Americans spend more than we do per capita. We're next. Uh, and one of the least effective systems. Our system is not very good at making people better. It's particularly not good at preventing people from getting sick so you don't have to make them get better. Uh, It's not that we're bad. We're just not as good as we should be and not as good as we could be and not as good as a lot of other countries are. Adelstein Brown is also thinking about health care management at the University of Toronto. Here's how he explains the discrepancy. There's a lot of countries that have greater success on managing chronic diseases like diabetes, uh, countries that have a lot greater success on making sure people get access to care quickly. Uh, We have a lot of countries that are much better at keeping uh, people at home so that they can age in their home uh, rather than in an institution. Uh, But they're not spending any more or less than us. Uh, So it's got to be something that we're doing then, right? not an overall underfunding issue, relatively. It's how we're spending that money. The problem, says Brown, is while other countries are implementing new health care innovations, innovations that are often developed by Canadians, Canada is not. You look at a lot of the neat things that are going on in health care, and lots of ways that we can redesign the way we organize or finance or structure uh, our services, uh, right from what's the role of nurse practitioners in delivering primary care, through to new ways of improving the safety and the quality of health care. A lot of those ideas that are common now in other systems actually started in Canada. In other words, Canada is great at creating health care knowledge, but we're not great at applying it to our own health care system. But change is already underway. The Canadian Health Services and Policy Research Alliance is working with experts across the country to change the way we train our graduate healthcare students so that they can be the ones to bring ideas to life in Canada. Bornstein explains. What we've constructed is a series of fellowship programs for doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows that get them out in the real world doing practical uh, work under the sponsorship and the collaboration with the healthcare institutions as part of their educational system. And Brown says Canada students are receptive, keen to take their work out of academia and into the community. When we surveyed students and had them on working groups, they're looking for support to have this type of impact. And fundamentally, you know, public health, health policy, health economics, health services research, all of these disciplines are applied disciplines. They're about inquiry and the synthesis of evidence to make sure that the health system gets better and people stay healthy. One advantage of getting academics off campus and into healthcare organizations is that new ideas can be developed and tested in the real clinical context with practicing health professionals. Another advantage is that regular engagement with new ideas helps hospital and clinical staff adjust to working in what are called learning health systems, which Brown says is essential if we want to do better and stay better. Fundamentally, a learning health system is a system that is constantly analyzing its own data, generating new evidence on what it's doing well, pulling in evidence from all the other stuff going on around the world, and using it to relentlessly improve the quality of the care and the organization of its services. Bornstein points out that learning healthcare systems can be tough to set in motion. There are real powerful entrenched interests in the world of healthcare that are wedded to the status quo. We're dealing with people who've been doing things in a certain way, who are trained to do things in a certain way, and are convinced that they're doing a good job 
and that they're helping people, which they are. So they're very reluctant to, to, to move from what they're currently doing to some other way of doing it because they're not sure that you're right. So, yes, it is a, it's a very serious and complex management challenge. Even so, Bornstein and Brown are confident this complex challenge is one that our new generation healthcare graduates, embedded in various clinical environments, will be best equipped to manage. Because, as Brown explains, in today's rapidly evolving healthcare environment, doctors and nurses can't be expected to do it alone. If you look right now at the pace of medical science and the on the really huge development of what we know we can do for patients. It has so transformed the complexity of decisions facing people that it's at times almost overwhelming. We can sort of say, oh, well, we just need to keep people in medical school or uh, in nursing school for another 10 or uh, 12 years so that they learn all this. But while they're learning all this, the technology and our understanding is advancing. So we need to find ways of helping them make better decisions. How are we making sure that when we are organizing care, not when the doctor makes a diagnosis or the nurse provides a treatment, not that that's technically correct, but how are they making the right decisions? How are they being reminded to check some of the things that are simple that can make for better care? Uh, And how are we organizing our systems so that actually it's not up to a patient or a family member or a heroic clinician working long, long hours trying to catch everything. How do we actually engineer safe systems to help people? There's been lots written about simple tools that we can use to make um, healthcare much safer, but it's not a new thermometer or a new stethoscope. They're management tools like checklists. For Evidence Network, I'm Nita Das McMurtry. You've been listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Connect with the latest nonpartisan health research from experts across Canada and around the world, or sign up to receive our free monthly e-newsletter at www.evidencenetwork.ca. You can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. EvidenceNetwork.ca is funded by the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Research Manitoba, and the University of Winnipeg.